how to make and improve uh, observations. But of late, we've had a lot of basic questions with respect to telescopes and all. So I thought that I would just kind of update the presentation to kind of add in, you know, some different telescope types and how they work. And really, this is just the three basic types. Uh, when we think of a telescope, uh, we everybody kind of thinks to Galileo, um, even though this was over 400 years ago, well over 400 now, um, everyone kind of seems to have this image on their in their minds. And so um, yeah, give me just one second and I'll take care of that. Uh, I don't know who that was. Anyway, uh, everyone kind of has this image in their mind. It basically Galileo's scope was a very uh, simple reflect refractor. Um, has a has uh, an objective one in one end and a fixed eyepiece in the other. Um, and so that was his telescope. Um, it's, it's, it has advanced a little bit more. And so this is where I thought we'd have just a discussion on basically, Jim, these are the, these are the ba basically the, the, the panels you gave me a few years ago about uh -huh. you know the three basic designs of the telescopes. And these are going to be the three basic designs that you're going to find on the market place um out there in the marketplace you know uh, as they go along and so we have the refractor again it's it's much like the galilean telescope you have a star out here or some ob object uh, we have the very front uh lens is known as an objective lens uh and so um it has a focal point it comes to a point right here and then it just slightly widens out and then you have a, an eyepiece that kind of brings that image into focus right here um, at the at the end of the, end of the eyepiece for your eye. So it's very simple. Uh, you can find a lot of examples of refractors on the market. I've got one here I can show you in just a minute, um, but um, you know they're super simple. Um, then um, really it was only about what 150 years later with uh, with um, with uh, Newton that the Newtonian refract refractor or sorry, reflector was actually developed. And in this case, we have your object. There's your, your star that's kind of out here in the cosmos. Light kind of comes into the scope, but then it bounces off this mirror, which is a parabola. And if you, if you know what a parabola does, any um, ray going into a parabola is always reflected back to a focus. And that focus happens to be um, at your eyepiece in, in the case of a Newtonian reflector. We have two mirrors, again, this, this parabolic reflector here that takes the incoming light, reflects it back to a secondary mirror, and then it gets bounced off into an eyepiece. And so that's kind of the basic operation of a, of a Newtonian reflector. And then we have, um, kind of a compound telescope. It's both a bit of a, of a refractor and a reflector. We know it as a catadioptric reflector. Um, very popular scopes would be the Schmidt Cassegrains. I, I'm a proud owner of a Schmidt, which I love. Uh, uh, and so um, basically there is a corrector plate at the very front of the scope. You have a star out here, light comes in, gets bent slightly. The mirror here is a spherical mirror. It gets bounced to another spherical mirror, and then the image gets uh, pushed out to the eyepiece where you can take it into focus. So that's really basically how the three basic types of scopes work. There are variations on every one of these themes. So, um, you know, so, uh, but you'll see some, um, you know, different ones in the, in the marketplace. Um, this is just uh, another panel uh, talking about the Newtonian reflector and the the, uh, the Cassegrain scope. I have a Cassegrain, and this is what this big yellow picture is right here. Um, but I thought we might uh, let me let me uh, go back to the eyepieces one in just a minute. Today, if you're going to pick up one of these scopes, this would be more of a refractor, uh, probably a refractor that I would not buy, and we could talk about why that would be uh, the case. But then the more you know, we have the Newtonian reflector sitting on a swivel mount and that's what we call a Dobsonian mount. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, and then we have um, the catadioptric right here, which is uh, a lot of people in the club own these Celestrons. And so um, those are pretty much the three basic types of scopes. 
thought I'd stop here now, let everybody else uh, make some comments uh, or if there are any questions. And you can unmute yourself, I think. Um, so can you Go hear ahead. me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Since, since we're on this, I see at the bottom, you've got a Dobsonian mount on some sort of maybe homemade device that does yeah. leveling. Yeah, they're can called you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, you can, they're expensive if you buy a commercial one, but if you're handy, you can actually make them. But they, all they do, let me get my hand up here. With, the earth is turning in one direction and they just turn the, they just ride on that curve, the opposite direction. So the telescope stays pointing at the same spot on the sky for maybe 20, 30 minutes, sometimes an hour if you have a fancy one. Yeah. Um, so they're pretty handy. I have a little one and, uh, I kind of like it, but it doesn't do everything, but it's a nice way to handle it. That way, once you've found an object, it stays in the eyepiece. Okay. Um, one of the things that concerns me about a Dobsonian mount is finding ground level enough to put it on. Would this take care of that problem? No, you level those things anyway, but that would be that you would do the same with the Dobsonian. I carry little blocks, little pieces of wood, just one inch, mm -hmm. half it, pieces of plywood and if it's particularly tipped over, I might stack two of them up to get it mostly level. But if you're just using a Dobsonian, it only has to be approximately level because okay. you're pointing it with a finder towards some area on the sky. And we can talk a little later about how you find what you're looking for, but it doesn't have to be all that level. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? <clears throat> So like like Jim was saying is, is that this this particular picture here is is of the wedge. So this would be a wedge for a Dobsonian that would basically you, you would angle it with respect to your latitude. So I think our latitude here is uh, what 35 degrees latitude. So you'd set this around 35 degrees and that would, and if you were trying to take a photograph that would help you actually keep it pointing at the same spot in the sky. You wouldn't see all that smearing that you get with the star trails and stuff like that. So, well, the and, advantage, I think, for, well, you have to know a little bit to know how to use one of those in the first place. But right. my first couple of years, uh, I didn't even know which way the sky was going. So if I found an object and was looking at it in the eyepiece and turned away to say, hey, Vivian, come and have a look at this. By the time we got there, it was gone and we didn't know where it went. So okay. <laughs> you had to start all over again, another 20 minutes to find the darn thing. Once you've done it, you'll realize the sky is always going in certain directions. So if it's not in there, it'll just be right over here. So it, it, after a little practice, that's not a big deal. But the Ponce mount, that's what those things at the bottom of the screen are called. Yeah, they yeah. just allow the scope to stay aimed at the same spot. And I'm sorry, what was that name again? P-O-N-C-E-T, I believe. Probably named after Mr. Ponce. Exactly. The Ponce, probably. Ponce. Oh, the uh, oh, the uh, you know the um, and over here on the right, this is an uh, an equatorial wedge for a for a uh, for a, for a uh, Schmidt uh, Cassegrain. This is actually the the wedge for the Celestron um, uh, 6SE. SE. Um, so you could uh, you know it's, it does the same thing, but for a, for a Cassegrain style scope, um, or why should say one of these. Um, fork arm one arm one arm bandit type scopes um so um you know you don't necessarily need one for uh, for this refractor because it's on a german equatorial mount a rather cheaply made one that uh, i might add but um you know uh in this case with the the you don't need a wedge because you've already got this ability to angle the scope at the at your lati correct latitude so but if you're just doing visual, purely visual, and you kind of know, like Jim said, if you kind of know the way the sky is moving and everything, yeah, you really don't need one of these. This is really comes more into play if you want to start taking some photographs and stuff like that. Okay. So, um, you know, this, uh, you really just need, you know, uh, the ability to, to um, find your object, uh, do a, you know, a little star hop to the object and then, you know, and then just look at it. So it, it, these really only come into play really if you're trying to do any type of photometric work. So I would 
also volunteer that I'm a, a visual only person. And I've been using um, Dobsonians for about 30 years. Mm -hmm. I have never had a Ponce platform. Okay. okay. I use other aids to find what I want. And then I just, I just push the telescope around to track the object I want to look at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, now, now, Vivian, aren't you putting yours like on a table? I mean, I, I think you're putting yours on a table now, right? Uh, or, no, I first off, um, I don't have a telescope and oh, okay. oh. hiding here off to the side where you can't see him. <laughs> also does not have a telescope. Okay. Um, I've been doing a lot of research the last couple of weeks and yeah. uh, I've read what's on the website. I've read a lot of other stuff. Um, so I'm nowhere close to purchasing and I'm actually considering buying a pair of binoculars to start. Um, yeah. And so I do have a question about those later. That's a yeah. real good idea. That's an excellent way to start is really with binoculars. Um, uh, I, um, at the beginning of the slide, a slide deck, I actually showed mm -hmm. um, a pair of 10 by fifties that I own. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in fact, I'll just flip over to that, that shot real quick. Uh, this right here is just a pair of Bushnell 10 by 50 binoculars that, mm -hmm. you know, um, that they're great uh, for for observing, um, and I and you can do the a lot of the uh, a lot of the binocular work mm -hmm. uh, in the club uh, in in, uh, in the AL. And we'll talk about about choosing an observing program uh, in in a bit. But um, these uh, these binoculars here uh, really uh, again, they're, and and they're not top of the line binoculars. I mean, you you can. Uh, and as Jim can tell you, I mean, you can you can uh, you can buy you a, a couple that that pay. They're about three thousand bucks a piece if you want to. But these, I think, you can pick up for about about <laughs> sixty bucks over at Walmart or over at Dick's. Mm -hmm. So um, they're great. But I mean, they're great. I, I've I've done a lot of binocular work with them, and they're great for birding. But they're also great. They're also not too heavy to mm -hmm. to hold. Once you get above. 50 millimeters on the objectives. This is a, what the 10 by 50 says. This is a 10X plus a 50 millimeter objective. Once you get above that, they're a little bit too unwieldy to, to, to hold. And so um, this, uh, you know, these are just kind of really the sweet spot for in my humble opinion for binoculars. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody else wants to make a, have a comment or. Uh, I've been doing the, um, I'm a beginner too. Uh, and I, that's been my approach is binoculars and a planisphere and some sky charts. And mm -hmm. just, just to get familiar where, with the patterns and, um, you know, I, I know how to do, I know how to recognize the summer triangle now. Mm -hmm. So I'm getting dangerous. But, All right. <laughs> but I found that my biggest challenge is um, if I want to stay out uh, for several hours, I've been playing with different kinds of chairs to, to lay back in uh, because that's the biggest thing. If I just stand there and with, you know, hold the binoculars over my head, boy, that doesn't take long till my arms about ready to drop off. So yeah. I've been playing with, uh, you know, beach chairs, you know, chairs that fold back far, you know, I was just curious what, uh, what have you guys found um, works for you? Well, I can tell you that my favorite way is just to lay in the grass or the driveway. Mm -hmm. And it's the same problem you're saying that if, if you're standing, you're, the binoculars get heavy, mm -hmm. but more so, I mean, even if you're standing, you can hold binoculars with your elbows resting on a car or a mailbox or a railing or whatever to help with the weight. But it, my neck goes haywire after a while. So I, sometimes I'll get into a lounge chair and I'll bend the back up just a tad and I'll try to rest the, um, the binocular eyepieces right here on the bones of my face and hold them and I don't mean moose grip hold them because they'll shake. But if you just kind of support the weight and do that from a beach chair, that works pretty well. And then the other thing is just to 
you know, lay on a picnic table or lay in the grass or on your driveway mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't, don't again, they call those gravity chairs too? Not the loud chairs, but those chairs that just go all the way flat. Mm -hmm. um, I've used those, but it's really difficult no matter how you do it. I'm not fond of lying on the ground, by the way, because there's critters there. Critters. <laughs> now, at some point, things that will eat you. Up on a <laughs> chair, but, but they make a parallelogram that if you're really going to be serious about binocular observing, uh, you have a parallelogram that you put the binoculars on one side and a weight on the other side. Right. So they just stay where you place them. So you can lean back in the chair. Doug's got one there and put the binoculars in front of your face, and then you don't have to hold them up. They just stay right. there. Mm -hmm. and that's it's much easier. And then you you get rid of all the shake that you're going to have when you're trying to hold something. Yeah. yeah. So so, if you're yeah. going to be a binocular observer, the thing Doug is holding up is a kind of a parallelogram device. Yeah, it's, it's what it is. It's basically, it's just like what Jim was talking about. It's, let me see if I can get the, uh, this is the end, oops. Um, this is where the binoculars kind of they're they're going to attach right here like that, and uh, so yeah, it it basically it's great because especially also too if you're observing with people the unique property of the parallelogram is is that if you um, if someone is shorter which I'm shorter than most people lower it down. You, you can lower it down and you won't and you won't won't move off the object it stays aimed at the same spot on the sky so if right. you have a child or pull it back up uh, to whatever height you need. So that's pretty handy. And yeah. if you're doing a lot of binocular observing and that's what you like, that's a worthwhile investment, I think. Yeah, I, yeah it is, it is. And it's it's been great. I've done it, but I've been like with Phyllis, I've just laid on the ground and looked like, especially like if you're trying to find M1 mm -hmm. and uh, it's directly overhead, just lay down on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, I can I can tell you that I I did uh, I started the binocular Messier um, project a number of years ago and I told Jim the story is is that it, I was uh, doing a, a contract out in out in uh, Moore let's see where was that uh, Wilkes County for Lowe's Corporation which is a number of years ago and one night I just sat in a lawn chair and I went from from uh, uh, Scorpius all, all the way over to Cap Capricorn. And I picked up about 30 objects that just sitting in a lawn chair and a pair of binoculars and just kind of like list, resting my arms on an armchair and leaning down and just doing this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of fun, you know, you can, and you can pick up quite a bit. Now, in fact, this is a really good time of the year to to peruse that uh, section of the sky known as the haystack, which again, the section from Scorpio so on over to Capricorn. Um, and there's a lot of really cool objects that you can just pick up a binoculars like that um, while we're talking about binoculars if i could ask usually people talk about starting with 10 by 50s mm -hmm. what do you think about 7 by 50s for a wider field of view they're fine okay yeah world war ii they did test and they found that you keep most people 20 year old soldiers apparently were the test people but mm -hmm. they could hold a seven seven by 50 means a magnification of seven right. times mm -hmm. with a 50 millimeter objective Right. And they could hold those steadily enough on a moving ship to catch a periscope sticking up. So there was some real work that went into finding the best possible hand holdable level. Most mm -hmm. of us like a little more power. So that's where we ended up at 10 by 50. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we can still hand hold that. And I use that to find a target. If I'm not quite sure where something is, mm -hmm. I can get the star field in the binoculars mm -hmm. and get oriented and then put the telescope on it. Um, much anything above 10 by 50, I, I wouldn't even try to handhold. Right, the, the right. Power gets so much that it's out of control. So then you really need the parallelogram or some device to hold it. Right. And, and that's a really great design. Um, are, is anybody familiar with the Orion Resolux line of binoculars? No, I have the Orion. I, I won the Orion Explorers in a uh, in a contest. Okay. An excellent and, way to get a pair. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, but uh, I'm not familiar with the other, that line. Um, you know, how much? It, how it's much? a little tricky because the ones that are really, there is a difference between really inexpensive binoculars mm -hmm. and really high end astronomy yeah. binoculars. And the difference is in daylight, they'll all look pretty good mm -hmm. most mm -hmm. of the time. And in fact, when your eyes are stopped down, you may have seven by 50 binoculars 
and they're delivering a seven millimeter exit pupil, which we don't right. need to worry about today. But if you're stopped down in daylight to about two millimeters on your eye, Mm-hmm. Everything looks about the same. The brightness is the same. It's not going to make any difference. And just looking at things in the real world, they all look pretty well. Uh, the better, higher end of binoculars usually are a little crisper and a little more contrast. But when you look at the stars at night, mm-hmm. then the game changes because if they're not perfectly uh, aligned, you'll see the star you're looking at might be two stars and they never merge. Right. And so the better binoculars are well aligned or collimated. Right. And uh, they will show fo- each eye will focus down to a pinpoint. Mm-hmm. Uh, and those cost more money. A mm-hmm. lot of times the less expensive ones won't quite get there, but you can still see the object. You can still see where it is, which is mm-hmm. what I'm using it for to find the uh, find something for the telescope. So you don't have to have premium mm-hmm. binoculars, uh, but it doesn't hurt if your pocketbook will support that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. The, the Nikon, you know, a lot of people for birding use the 10 by the eight by 42s. Oh, really? So okay. They're not as bright, but see in daylight, when you're looking at birds, you're not trying to get every ounce of light into mm-hmm. your eye. You're trying to see the real world, but those work real well on the sky as well. So there, there's not one that's perfect. Uh, any of them are fine. Okay. Right. Okay. Thanks. So with binoculars, can you see nebulae and um, galaxies? Yeah, very, very small in most cases, but yeah, yeah. they're there. Yeah, I've tried, I've tried in my neighborhood, and I think my sky is just too polluted. That would be the answer to that question. Yeah, I can't even do it yeah. from here with a telescope. I live right next to Crabtree Valley, and uh, it's a real chore to find a nebula. Yeah. One yeah. thing, Rob, it, if you have binoculars, it's just not that hard to go out someplace with the binoculars that's darker. You still have to do it, but it's a lot different from loading all your gear in the car with telescopes and all that stuff. Right. Um, but I observe regularly with seven by fifties that are really old. Mm-hmm. And I'll yeah. use those in the yard, but I have a larger pair. I, where are they 16 by seventies? And I always put those on a mount. So it's a, a juggling act between, do I want the handheld or do I want the mounted? Mm-hmm. And it really de- depends on where I'm gonna be. Okay. Yeah. Simple yeah. is usually better because you'll do it. Yeah. If it's too complicated and there's too many steps to set it up or it's too heavy, mm-hmm. uh, all these things will keep you from using it. And the old famous saying you'll you'll encounter in the future is that the what is the best telescope? It's the one you use the most. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter about size. It's, it's If it's too large and heavy, it'll do the job, but you may not use it more than twice a year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and, and I think it's a, it's a good segue into like, for instance, it, with the, with the, especially with the refracting telescopes, a lot of people will buy these refracting telescopes because they look, it, it's at least complicated. So it must be good. And, you know, <laughs> But it's it's we find uh, on a regular basis um, these kinds of scopes just sitting in garages because people took them out there. They tried to find something at night. It was really frustrating. They didn't know how to angle it. And quite frankly, a lot of these this is a cheap uh, equatorial mount. So it's not as uh, there's not as much precision and quality in, into the in, that goes into the mount. And so it makes it very difficult. This is why a Dobsonian is so much simpler because literally you just put the, you put this, whoops. Put it down and use it. Yeah. You put the base down, you put the, this, this tube, which we call an OTA optical tube assembly. You just put that into the, into the base and you're ready to go. It's like from car to grounds about 30 seconds, Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) and so easy to use because then you just point and shoot, um, you know, at the sky. Um, Part of that pointing and shooting, though, means that you need to have your, uh, and I do want to kind of go into this because I know we've been having questions about this, is that usually there's a finder scope at the very, uh, on, on the scope. It's either going to be a, a small refractor or it's going to be a red dot finder. And we need to align that, um, that with, the, uh, with, the, with the main tube. So there's been some questions in the club of late about how to do that. 
So uh, I've got Barton on, and he, let me just go back. Here's a uh, this this uh, other another Schmidt Cassegrain. Um, see, here's a basically another example of finder scope. These two pieces need to be in alignment with one another to actually make for a successful um, uh, for you to help you find objects in the night sky. So Barton has actually uh, put together a little presentation, and I'm going to let uh, Barton share here. Share his. Go ahead, Barton. I think maybe you can share now. Um, this is my uh, first time sharing my screen like this. So. <laughs> I'm going to stop my share. So you should be able. To, you should be able to click on share screen. Yeah, I've got too many windows open. That's my problem right now. But um, oops. no, that's not the right one. <laughs> Just a second. Here it is. There we go. There we go. Okay. Um, and uh, let me get back to it again. Okay. So the, the problem is, is the finder is supposed to help you find things, but as, uh, as you take it out of the box or take it out of your car, you'll, the, the finder will be pointing to a slightly different spot in the sky. Can everybody see my slides and hear me okay? I can yeah. see them. All right, great. And uh, alignment is best done in the daytime, uh, especially when you, you first do it. Um, so you can uh, do, um, realize what's going on and probably there's a bigger adjustment that needs to be made the first time. But you want to uh, get somewhere where you can see um, something that's far in the distance, uh, a light pole, um, a cell phone tower, a chimney, something like that. Um, and it can be done at nighttime from bright star or planet, but it, you may be uh, maybe a little bit harder to do that. Um, and the way that you adjust your finder is going to depend on what finder you have. Um, there's probably some um, on the left. There's some. Um, the, there's a, the finder part is actually missing, but uh, there would normally be a little telescope in between, and uh, by changing the uh, silver knobs, you can adjust which way it's pointing. Uh, the finder on the right has uh, some knobs on the back that adjust the direction. But that's going to depend on what finder that you have that came with your telescope. Um, and so the, the procedure that you go through, it's probably uh, not starting in the right place is the, is the problem most people have. Um, so if you use a low magnification eyepiece, um, Will make it a little bit easier. And you first, you want to adjust your scope so that you can find the distant object in the telescope. And then you adjust the finder so that the view through the finder also um, narrows in on the uh, object in the distance. And again, whether that's a, uh, a telephone pole or a uh, bright star, um, you would use that procedure. And then you can, if you want to, you can repeat this process with an eyepiece that provides more magnification and you can get even, even better. Uh, typically, a, a finder is going to have some sort of um, a crosshair or red dot or something that indicates where the middle of it is. And um, your telescope, in general, uh, will not have that, depending on probably most eyepieces will not provide that. But um, um, but the finder will have a, uh, a crosshair or something in the middle, and that is what you'll use to align up on the object. And um, so your scope is going to prop, is going to uh, flip things either upside down or backwards left or right or both, um, depending on what type of scope you have and um, how many mirrors are in the optical path and same things like that. And there's some debate on whether your finder should do the same thing as your um, telescope, or should the finder match what you naturally see with your eye. Um, and different people are like that in different ways. And I, I just want to point out that um, um, you may um, 
may want to get a different finder in the future. Um, and the, the finder, there are two main types. There's um, the, the top, ones at the top have uh, no magnification, um, which works surprisingly well. Um, they um, are, are simple to use, and um, the image on the right gives you an, uh, a, a visual of what it would look like using the TELRAD system. It's going to project um, red circles on the sky when you look through it properly. Um, there will be batteries on that. Um, the other type of finder is the magnifying finder, and these are they're actually like small telescopes or um, you could think of it as half of a binocular. Um, they do have a, uh, typically they have an eyepiece with a uh, cross uh, hair on them or, or something to help you uh, um, determine what the center of the finder is. Um, and typically those will be 6x to 9x magnification. And the objective size will be 30 to 50 millimeters. And all of those are would live in considerably more light than your eye would, um, which is typically five to seven millimeters. So um, you'll see brighter stars, and um, you'll see more stars um, with a, um, a magnifying finder. Um, on the other hand, the, uh, the the using light uh, the type at the top, like the Telrad, you probably won't see you will, you will not see as bright as stars or as many stars. But you will have a uh, much more intuitive um, understanding of where you're pointing the scope. Um, if you if you know through star hopping, you you know that uh, the, the object you're looking for is uh, two thirds of the way between these two bright stars, and it's a little bit towards the north star. Then you will um, pretty rapidly um, grasp where you need to uh, point your scope. And that's about all I have to say. I'm sure I <laughs> may have raised more questions than I answered, but uh, I, I hope that'll be useful. Well, let me let me mention that when I first started many years ago, probably before Phyllis or about the same time, I bought a right angle finder like the one in the lower right hand side there. And since I was looking down at the telescope, it's much more convenient to look that way than to get your head all the way around, but I could never decide looking through the right angle finder uh, which star was the bright star I thought I was looking at. You know, you have to know where you are in the sky. Mm -hmm. And the tail red, which is the upper right hand uh, picture in white, or the, the, the blocks there, produces a little target like you see over on the right hand side of the screen. And there's no magnification, it's just a little piece of glass, and you see a target. So you're looking at the sky and the usefulness of that target is, is, what is it, a half a degree, two degrees, three degrees. So you can use the circles to figure out how far something is away. And if you have a rough idea from a star chart where the thing is, you can put that target in that area and then use the circles to figure out how far to move. And then if you have a right angle finder, you can look in there and see if you're lucky and the, the objects there. But I really had to start with the tail red so mm -hmm. I could just figure out where I'm looking for what that's worth. Usually, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, the, like, red, the red dot finder would do that, but you don't have the dimensions. You just have a little red dot. But and they're, that, they're a little less expensive usually, I guess. Yeah. So it sounds like um, whatever telescope you buy, if you don't like the finder on it, you can switch it out? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Or add another one. You can generally yeah. uh, around the tube. There are enough places. The manufacturers have put mm -hmm. enough places for you to to actually insert different you know pieces of, of equipment. And so you can actually add. You know, you could have two. You could have a tail rad, and then you could have a a, a six by nine finder or a nine by, nine by thirty finder. I well, think that Mark, that makes some sense because when you're looking, you're you're using the tail rad to figure out pretty much where you are. But right. then that that finder that might be an eight by fifty or whatever, so it's like half of a binocular. Right. In fact, if you've got a binocular at home that's misaligned and, and you're not using it, you can unscrew it in the middle and just mount one of the binoculars on it, make a little mount. It's you could tape it almost, but it's hard to aim it. But 
you could use a single binocular half to aim the telescope. And the advantage there is what he just mentioned. You see more stars, you see more deeply. So right. if you're looking for that galaxy that I guess Rob mentioned, you'd have a better chance of seeing it in the binocular. Right. But if you know kind of where it is, like Andromeda, most of us in the city, I can't see Andromeda. If I'm up at Stanton River or at our star party where the sky's dark, you can actually see Andromeda naked eye. So mm -hmm. then you, it's not hard to point at. So using both of those in conjunction is a good thing. And like on my first go at it, I didn't want to decide where to put the tail rad. It comes with glue, little double-sided tape and a mm -hmm. mount, a little base. But I just used a cord and tied the base around the tube with a bow knot and used it that way for two or three years until I decided where I wanted to stick it. So uh -huh. you don't have to ruin or mar your telescope. Mm -hmm. And they're um, all movable. Vivian, what kind of scope are you thinking of or do you know? Um, well, I've looked at a lot of stuff and and you guys have on your website um, the Celestron Next Star 8 inch and the Orion and Telescope 8 inch. And and I've looked at both of those in a fair amount of detail. Um, honestly, one of the things that concerns me is that the Celestron's got the motorized mount. And if you run out of power for whatever reason, or it the, it breaks, can you manually move that telescope around, or are you just you can't use it until it gets fixed? I think you can move it manually. Does anybody know for sure? I, I don't know that scope. Okay. Yeah, I uh, I I don't know that you can move the because it's just a one one arm one arm bandit basically. It's the gears are there in it i'm i'm not sure you, you i think you can move it in the you can in the uh in the ra direction but the declination direction i don't think you can move manually uh, what, I'm, so, I'm sorry go ahead so that would be a mess. yeah i mean some of the like you know like with 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 the mead i can move it manually um if i'm if i'm out of power or if the if if the uh, motors are broken or something like that you know the thing is, um, you know, overall, I mean, those 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 instruments last a long time. And I'll give you a really good case in point. Uh, we do take uh, uh, club donations. Mm -hmm. uh, and recently. We had a guy donate a, one of the first SEs that were made. Mm -hmm. He donated that to the club and it's still working, mm -hmm. you know, and that was probably well over 15 years ago so it's it's you know maybe not the first one that was made but it was you know and and it and, but it's still working and still works really well okay. so mike i think mike right now has that he's evaluating it right now but i mean they they uh, generally they hold up pretty well okay. um you know i have a mead lx 200 which i bought when i joined the club back in 1997 <laughs> so it has held up for for 20 years for oh, well well over 20 years now um and you know i now i have repaired it myself a couple of times um but um overall i mean the the platform is is pretty solid uh, but you can you know it now i want to say is that it is difficult um unless uh, you you um you have to have you have to know how to use setting circles but if you know what the what the um, the right ascension and the declination of the of the object is that you're looking for, all the all the motors are doing is is they're taking a right ascension and a declination uh, with respect to your latitude and also uh, with respect to where you are in the year, mm -hmm. and they're they're slewing to the object. Now you can make that uh, that calculation in your head or you know, pretty easily and and move the scope there um but um you know um let me go ahead and share my screen again um the um so the, you can move them um now the intelescope which you're what you're looking at um is a is a is a um you know it's a push to so mm -hmm. if you run out of power or you or you run out of uh or, or the let's say the hand controller is not working. You can still use that like a Dobsonian. And so, right. Doug, what are you showing us? This is uh, astronomical league screen. Yeah, I was going to talk about how to because uh, one of Vivian's questions was, 
observing and stuff like that. So I was okay. going to go uh, move on to that, but I, I'll stop. Uh, I'll, I'll, let's we are let's uh, before I get into that discussion. I'll just um, you know uh, I don't know what what, are you, what do you guys want to say about 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 the various choices, various scope choices. Well, I was actually going to pitch the Dobsonian because that's yeah. about as simple as you can go. Right. And it doesn't require any power at all, except that, that you know, everybody, I suspect, if you're like any of all the rest of us, you want to tell, you want to get a great telescope. You want it to be the right one, you know, the one you're going to buy and use forever. But the truth is they're just tools like a big hammer and a little hammer. Uh, no one telescope does everything that you're going to maybe want it to do. Right. A lot of the group likes to image, but an imaging scope is not necessarily what you want to do to see faint objects. You need aperture for, for dim things right. to see right. visually. So it's uh, it seems like something around eight or 10 inch Dobsonian. I, uh, six will work fine and eight is a little better uh, and 10 right. maybe beginning to get a little heavy for some people. Right. But the Dobsonian, the advantage, and I started out with that years and years ago. And we would go out to uh, Lake Jordan when it was actually quite dark out there. And you would observe for a couple of hours. And the thing I loved about the Dobsonian was I lifted the actual tube assembly off of the mount and put it in the car and picked the mount up and put it in the car or the van and drove home mm -hmm. in about two minutes. Right. right. And Doug was disassembling his very fancy <laughs> 10 inch complicated telescope. I was probably in bed asleep by the time he got home. So, so it depends that, on that, what you want to do. But that the is easiest the one is the Dobsonian. It takes very yeah. little effort. And this shouldn't be something you're approaching from. I want to get there to the end of the run right now. This is a, a fun lifetime learning curve. You will yeah. probably own more than one telescope. Mm -hmm. One won't be better than another. They're just different. Uh, the view through a refractor is pinpointy, pretty stars. But most of us can't afford a refractor much bigger than four inches, maybe five inches. But yeah. when you get much beyond that, you have to take out a bank loan. Yeah. yeah. And a, yeah. a reflector, you can have a fairly large mirror at a fairly reasonable price. So... Mm -hmm. The bang for the buck is what we used to tell beginners. Uh, if you're not a Dobsonian, it can have a motor. I used to tease people about needing the motor, but if you don't know how to align your basic telescope, if you don't know which star is which, it's kind of hard to align one of these automatic telescopes. Some of them will do that for you, but the, half the fun is learning the sky. So the binoculars are useful. Mm -hmm. A simple telescope is useful. And at some point after you've done it a year or two, if it turns out this is your thing, mm -hmm. uh, then you'll know how to make that jump to the one that suits whatever it is you're trying to, to do accomplish. You won't know that now. A question yeah. about the optics. Um, between Celestron and Orion, do you guys feel like one company's optics are measurably better than the other? Oh, that's a toughie. I doubt it. <laughs> any telescope compared to any other telescope, mm -hmm. you could see differences in quality. Okay. Right. But some companies have a little bit better reputation than others. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you're buying mail order, you're going to get whatever you get mm -hmm. and you can evaluate it or get somebody in the club to help you evaluate it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you know how that one does, but to say that the Orion line is better than the Celestron line it's probably very hard to do at this point. Things well, Orion, Orion is not making anything. They're branding yes. it. Uh, they're buying it from somewhere off. And I would guess, wouldn't we say in China? Uh, most probably in China. They're and probably, uh, they're just most, branding most it. Most optics are coming from China now. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, that may not be I mean, really detectable. And the I real, the one thing that will prevent you from seeing subtle things that you're hoping to see is the atmosphere, not the telescope. Okay. Yeah. Most of the yeah, telescopes now are much better than they were, the commercial ones. Right. Uh, some yeah. of us here, Doug and, and Phyllis and I, have actually made our own mirrors and can measure them and tell how good they are. But on any given night, uh, I sometimes forget and think I have a crummy mirror, but it's the atmosphere. Right. Uh, right. So unless you have a really good night, the distinction that you're thinking about making is not even there. Okay. Well, like, you like now. Y'all mentioned that Orion is sourcing their telescopes from China and then branding them. Is Celestron making their own optics? 
They're okay. getting them from China. Almost everybody is getting them somewhere else. Okay. So okay. Teleview uh, is make is bringing theirs in. Uh, there are there's one eyepiece company, Brandon, that makes theirs entirely in America. There's a guy locally named Harry Siebert in Clayton who actually makes his eyepieces. Uh, personally, he machines the actual assembly and gets his optics. Uh, some of them come from Edmund Scientific, but mm -hmm. uh, he designs and makes optics. But most everything you buy commercially on these big companies you've heard of are going to come from out of the country. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And, and they're going to, it's very, it's like a, you just have to take a chance. Okay. Yeah. But I, I'll say, like, I, I guess, like, for instance, um, in terms of, uh, as Jen mentioned, Jen mentioned with the Dobsonian, it's very simple. There's very few things that can go wrong with the scope. Uh, less parts, less moving parts is means it's going. It's less to repair. But I've I've actually uh, now I don't think Jim. A number of years I would go. I bought a, an Odyssey Eight off of uh, uh, off of Craigslist, and uh, the thing is, was a 1984 Dobsonian. It's an eight. It's an eight inch F uh, F four, um, and. Uh, it's uh, it's 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 what well, I think a 1984 was its was its heyday, but it's the mirror still good in good shape and it's a great little scope. Um, so it's uh, I you know again it's it's very simple. It's just, I just have like I bought a red dot binder for it, and I stuck it on there, and it works very well. And if it's small and lightweight that you can carry out easily, right. you'll use it more often. Right. Yeah, exactly. There's, there's one thing that we haven't touched on regarding choosing telescope, mm -hmm. and that is the different telescope designs are really best for different things, right. Yeah. but the mechanical package of the thing. Mm -hmm. When I first started observing, I had a C8 because it would fit in my car. Mm -hmm. So depending on what kind of car you have, that may or may not be an issue. Mm -hmm. But right. just the, the, the physical size of the telescope is, right. is a consideration. And after that, you have to ask yourself, well, what do I want to look at? Mm -hmm. And if you, if you just want to look at everything, mm -hmm. then that, um, that schmidt Cassegrain package okay. is pretty good at everything but it's not excellent at anything. Yeah. <laughs> so that was, that was my choice in the beginning because I wanted to see everything I could find. Okay. And it yeah, took you, me a long way. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And would, would you say the Dobsonian is better for um, deep space? Generally, yes. Taking in more light. Yeah. 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 Okay. More deep. Well, I, yes, I, say, I would say I use my Dobsonian for well, planetary and lunar. Well. Depending I, on how it's made. Yeah, it does depend on the design. Like this F four uh, that I've got, this Odyssey, it's a it's a good little planetary scope. It's you know it's it's uh, it's not as it doesn't have as long a focal length as my as my um, as my uh, um, you mean my Schmidt yeah my Schmidt yeah my, my mm -hmm. me, but uh, it's got a really fast mirror. It's much the mirror is actually faster than my than my uh, uh, than the Mead. So it does uh, the actually the first time I actually uh, saw a transit um, of Jupiter was through the Dobsonian. I was looking through the Dobsonian one night and and I saw a black spot on Jupiter. And I said, <laughs> "Why is that there?" <laughs> you know. And I looked at my sky uh, my sky mapping software, and sure enough, there was a transit going on. And I don't think I'd ever seen a transit going on, on in my. Now I've seen plenty now in my Dobson, in my in my Schmidt. But a, a transit is the shadow of one of the moons passing over the planet. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I apologies. I've heard, <laughs> yeah. I've heard the term fast, um, but I can't remember what the definition is. Can you refresh my memory? You said you had a fast mirror on the Dob. Short yeah. focal length. Yeah, shorter focal length, so that means that that the you know, light doesn't have as far to travel, and it's it's so it's fat basically faster. You'll, you'll have a shorter tube assembly, but you right. won't get as much magnification. The longer the actual tube, the, mm -hmm. now this is not going to be the case with the Schmidt Cassegrain right. that Phyllis described because right. they're bouncing the light up and down the tube several times, so right. it acts as if it's long. Right, but, right. Uh, I have a little three f a uh, six inch three point nine. It's got an excellent mirror. Ooh. Mm -hmm. And I have a six and three quarter inch F11. 
Mm -hmm. And they're both good mirrors, but the long one, the F11, which mm -hmm. is about 80 inches long, so it's not practical. I have to have a, a van to carry it anywhere. Yeah. But it can see through turbulent air better because mm -hmm. it's basically stopped down to F11. Uh, like if you think about a camera, when you open it wide, you get a shallow depth of focus. So mm -hmm. things in the background are blurry or foreground and that's good for portraiture because you want the face to be sharp and the things behind you not. Mm -hmm. But if you want to see things in turbulent air, I have found the longer the focal length, the more it accommodates bad air. Okay. But okay. then that's a big thing to carry around. So I hardly ever use it, but mm -hmm. I, you know, I know it would do that. A really short, short scope uh, would, could be a great mirror, but if the air is turbulent on a given night, that movement of the air causes the image to appear to be blurry, even though the mirror is perfect. Okay. So you'd have mm -hmm. to have a great night for that scope to reach its potential, where my big old long clunky scope works pretty well on any night. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank That's you. That's not really helpful, but it's just a fact. Yeah. It I helps. Think, it actually helps a little. <laughs> I've been looking at these this uh, scope, these uh, tabletop Dobsonian scopes. And one that's kind of those are short. Eye. Yeah, they're short. And uh, but there's this one that's that's uh, I guess uh, promoted by the Astronomers Without Borders. Yeah. And it has like a it's like a telescopic uh, tube assembly, and uh, it looks like uh, it would be a nice next step up from the binoculars. And like 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 you're talking earlier, it's lightweight is portable you know you just kind of pull it out of your back seat your backpack whatever set but only the problem is I, i'd have to have a table right. i'd have to level the table and i don't know about it when it's and it's like a it's a f5 5.3 inch primary mirror i'm looking at the data sheet right now um and uh, the only thing that uh bothers me a little bit is that open tube assembly once you Extend, extend it. You now got this open tube. My guess is you got to make sure you're in. You're on real dark ground, otherwise, uh, peripheral lighting, I guess, could affect uh, your images. Yeah, it's good. Uh, you probably uh, they. Uh, do you go? Have you been to Stanton River State Park yet? When we're going to have a star party in a few months? Uh, I've I've done a day trip up there just to investigate because I okay. Well, I, the reason I mentioned it is they have about eight of those uh, little ones, and I I don't know if they're exactly the ones without borders, but it's the same idea. They they open out. They have a couple of tubes. You can actually get a shroud, a little car, have somebody in your family just sew together, or perhaps you can sew together. Didn't mean to go the wrong way with that statement. Uh, you could just put a little shroud around it to shield the rest of the. Uh, light path but they seem to work pretty well if you're in a dark site then the light won't be a problem it would be a problem if you're near a street light here in raleigh right. but if you're in a dark site it can be open and those actually perform pretty well and they check them out to people who are camping at the park to try out so before you bought one you might want to go up there and camp overnight and use their scope and see what you think about it yeah yeah i um yeah, and uh, I uh, I talked to them about that, and um, what's interesting about that park is that they don't have gates that they close. They told me that, uh, like the rangers, there won't be anybody on site after say ten o'clock. No, but that That's, is a good thing because a yeah. lot of the a lot of the parks in North Carolina lock their gates, yeah. in, which means you can't either come or go. Yeah, and they told me I could come and go. Like I don't yeah. actually have to be camping there because. Uh, I've done a lot of camping in the past, and it's a little bit hard on my back now. But uh, <laughs> so, uh, so I kind of like that idea. And then you could drive into maybe uh, I think it's called South Boston, and yeah. you know you could spend the night there or something. Yeah. Camp out uh, in the holiday. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. yeah I'm not going to mention that they rent cabins because that's always a fight to get one, and I'm at an age when I always try to get one. So yeah, so, so, yeah it's a. Uh, the, the park, that's an excellent place to go. It has a dark sky rating and they work on it and they're all very supportive, uh, almost the entire staff. So, they, and they do, I, I watched them check out a lady and her two daughters and they were explaining how to use this somewhat complicated looking scope, you know? So I don't know how the first time you try, 
Uh, occasionally, some of us go up there and, and align the scopes to make sure they're still set up accurately. But uh, that's something you will eventually learn if you use a Dobsonian. You'll need to learn how to do uh, the alignment yourself to make sure, sure. it's performing perfectly. Um, yeah. A couple of questions. When is the star party at Stanton? It's October, is it October 4th? 4th or the whatever 10th? that week is. It's like the 4th to the 10th, something like that. I think that's what they say normally in their site. Unfortunately, I'm a member of that Chaos Club, and I can only apologize. The website has not changed lately, and it's not updated, but uh, you do have to register yeah. for the event. And I'm not registered yet either because I haven't seen them bring that up yet. Okay, it's the Chaos website? That Chapel Hill, it's Chapel Hill astronomical observational society okay okay which spells amazingly enough chaos chaos yes um and that brings up another question um i saw somewhere that your scope needs to uh the, the, the temperature inside your scope needs to match the yeah, ambient acclimate to the uh, yeah it, it equilibrate to the outside temperatures ideally you you don't have to wait but yes it will work much better if you can and is that every type of scope or, or are the, is it just scopes that are like the, the Schmidt cast grains that are sealed? Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm confused. Well, my answer would have been yes, but I saw Phyllis shake her head no. So let her explain what this is. You know, if you keep a refractor or a Schmidt cast, um, not quicker. in bright sunlight, for example, just let's say you keep it in your garage. Mm -hmm then we generally take ours just outside and start using it. Mm -hmm. Now, you can see some tube currents in there, mm -hmm. but tube currents is the swimmy look okay. you know, to your view. You can see that in the refractor, but you mm -hmm. probably might see it in a Schmidt cast, and you will see it in a Dobsonian. Yeah. Well, there so, is a whole whole can of worms here because if you have a triplet refractor, it takes, I'm just saying what I've read. I don't even know if I agree. They say the triplet takes longer to reach equilibrium because it has three elements and one of them is trapped Four between glass. the other two. Yeah, but Schmidt is sealed on both ends. So it holds some heat. Uh, I, I build scopes. So I put fans on the front and back of my mirrors. And right, that takes care of that. She's asking about a beginner use yeah. case, I think. Well, well I, and I think the answer there is probably any of these telescopes will hold some heat and you do want the heat to equalize with the uh, nighttime temperature. However, okay. so regardless of whether uh, it's a refractor or a reflector or a, or a cast grain, it's going right. to need some time to acclimate. It's going to be much more pronounced on a reflector. Yeah. Okay. And the way we okay. deal with that, I've got an eight inch um, Dodsonian. Mm -hmm. And if I'm going out to Big Woods or something, I'll set it up and, you know, align the optics and all that stuff. And then I will set it. I, I don't generally leave it pointed straight at the sky in case a bird comes over. <laughs> okay. So I'll lean it a little bit so that any heat in the primary mirror can escape and mm -hmm. I'll go visit people. Mm -hmm. and you can come back and you can see that swimmy business going mm -hmm. on and it's just a matter of choice to me as to whether I'm going to deal with that right now or not okay. if I'm looking at Jupiter mm -hmm. I don't want to see that right if I'm looking at some galaxy it doesn't really bother me okay and so after you've had the thing out in the night air for an hour generally it'll stop now with my bigger um, Dobsonian, I do have fans and I do run them and they do help a lot. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So if, if you were thinking about Schmidt cast telescope, I wouldn't worry about it. Mm -hmm. If you get the Dobsonian, just let it mm -hmm. cool off for a while. Okay. Well, yeah. if you're, if you're going to observe in your home or in your backyard, you just set it outside and when you come home from work or whatever and let it sit out there while you have dinner and then it's ready to go. Okay, okay. We have one but, member who sets his telescope up in his garage mm -hmm. and he'll blow a box fan on it while he's dinner. Okay. So there are ways. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So let me just say, but don't let that stop you from observing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, 
I mean, I, you know, and, and I, and I do use primarily my Schmidt for, for observing. And, you know, when I first take it out, you know, uh, if you try to get focus lock on a star, mm-hmm. it, it'll, it'll be boily. It'll kind of be looking like this, you know, mm-hmm. literally. And so it's, you know, it, I just, uh, you can, it, that's good enough to kind of do a rough alignment if you're going through an alignment procedure or whatever. And just uh, and don't let that stop you from observing. Just recognize it for what it is. It's not a defect in your in your product. It is it is just simply a factor of, of the of the thermals, as everyone else has said. Okay. But yeah, use that. You know, leverage that. You know, don't uh, don't don't lose your observing time. You know, waiting for the scope to to get to thermal equilibrium. Now, if you're doing something like trying to split double stars. Which a lot of us have tried to do, yeah. I probably want to get to the thermal equilibrium because it's really difficult to to split a, you know, two stars that are doing this, you know. So yeah, and but mostly what Doug is describing there, and what to some extent Phyllis was describing, is actually the atmospheric turbulence that you're seeing that's causing all that. That the yeah. the, the the trouble with the uh, the cooling off of the optics in the telescope would only probably in most cases just be less sharp. You, yeah. you go, boy, my mirror is no good. It'll and that's solid. not what it yeah. is at all. You just have to let it equilibrate and then wait for the object to be above about 30, 35 degrees. If, if you look at it towards the horizon, it's always going to look soft and fuzzy. Right. Uh, and depending on what it is, if it's a galaxy, it doesn't have a lot of tiny detail generally. So that you could start looking at a galaxy or two or a, a planetary nebula. And then when you want to look at the moon crater, uh, specifically, or watch that little black shadow that Doug mentioned cross transit Jupiter. Mm-hmm. That's when you want it to be sharp. And so you do that several hours into the session, mm-hmm. not right at the beginning. Uh, sure. so, you know, it's just one of those things. And you just adjust yourself to that. As astronomers, you have to be sensitive to time. Sure. You're, on the, you're on the universe's schedule. It doesn't right. matter when you want to do it. Yeah. <laughs> it has to be high enough and steady enough. Mm-hmm. and a decent enough piece of equipment and you're good to go. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Now, so, 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 some of y'all were asking, and I'm going to change just for a second. You were asking about books and uh, I kind of, I didn't mention this, but this is Night Watch by Terrence Dickinson. 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 I just want to be sure I was saying his name right. What I liked about it, it has a lot of stuff in it, but the star charts, uh, can you see that this is, I don't know if you can tell it, the Big Dipper, mm-hmm. somewhere there, or it's the Major. This one has about eight or 10 or 12 charts, and this one is uh, Leo. And so like some of us, we can recognize Orion, most of us. We can recognize the Big Dipper, I'm <laughs> guessing. Some of you could probably pick out uh, Leo, the lion. And this book, instead of showing you the whole sky, just shows you a section around a very recognizable constellation. And and there's lots of stuff around each of them. So you just go to that constellation and look on that page and figure out the things around it. And then you move on to another, like the teapot in Mm -hmm. the south, where the center of the galaxy is. Those things helped me figure out where other things were. Okay. Without having to learn the whole sky at the same time. Right. That's so, great. Uh, Night Watch by Dickinson. And they keep reprinting this thing over and over. I buy yeah. mine used in the bookstore. They're, they're like $20 or $30 new, but in the bookstore, they're 4 or $5. Because yeah. once they become outdated, the star charts are still perfectly fine. Yeah. I like the spiral bound version of that. Yeah, too. that's what this is. Yeah, you know. I, I noticed you were showing that up. So you can just that's actually actually was the first star chart that I that I owned was was Nightwatch, uh, and uh, he's, he's also got a lot of gr- other great information in there about yeah. astronomy and getting started. But I loved it because I could fold it around. And the other thing too is is that because we are living in a light polluted area, he doesn't show every star in the sky. He only shows the major stars, and it really you can only which really is all we can that. see. Oh, exactly, is it was all we can see. So. So yeah, I, I I always liked that. It always gave me a, a was so simple to use and everything. Um, I have graduated uh, to uh, I, I do like the the pocket sky atlas. I'm going to show that right yes, there. Yes, and I agree. Yeah. And this is really another really simple one because literally 
um, you know, you can, you know, you can flip over to, you know, here's a really good example. You know, here's Hercules right now. And oops, kind of yeah. hard, kind of hard to show that in the oops. Yeah, uh, there we go. Um, so there's Hercules right there. And, and again, it does a really good job of showing where this where the deep sky objects are around there. And, you know, if you can find the constellation Hercules, then you can just sit there and, and just walk around that square and find all courses, all sorts of interesting stuff. So, you know, yeah, see, also, that's what we all probably carry that one, the pocket yeah. sky atlas from sky and telescope that covers the whole sky. But for me, initially, that was like a little too too many things mm -hmm. yeah. and the other book where i could find the big dipper i could find orion a couple of things and learn those and then i found out there was constellations between each of those and right i still don't know what's in camelo or camel <laughs> camel i can't even pronounce so <laughs> you know i have to use my north carolina accent on some camel i don't yeah. know there's several ways to say that but yeah, you know, the camel. How about yeah. mono, monocerotis? <laughs> sounds like right. a it sounds like a liver disease. That's not right. <laughs> it probably is. <laughs> I know it's not, I probably know it's probably not. Right. But you know, you're not going to learn everything in the first six months, in the first year, the first five years. But it wouldn't be much of an endeavor if you could just figure it out in a couple of weeks. It's uh, right. this is a thing that's fun when you're young. It's fun when you're old. If you were interested at ten or right. twelve years of age, you're probably going to be interested in middle age. Uh, a lot of us had to wait to earn enough money to buy a telescope. So mm -hmm. a lot of people come into this hobby around 35 or 40. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you have plenty of years to figure things out. Right. <laughs> it just, it just, it's just a pleasure just to, to sit under the night sky and just say, oh, you know, I wonder what's there. You yeah, know? Or, and get with folks at a star party now that we can kind of go back, mm -hmm. unlike tonight. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, look at what they're, you find out what they're looking at and they can point it out for you. And, uh, and then you try it in your scope and okay. objects look different in different size apertures. The, you right. see different kinds of, uh, it reads differently. It's the same object, but it just presents differently in bigger scopes. So, you know, there's no end to the, the things you can find and, and the science moves forward in ways we could not have conceived 25 years ago. Right. what we would be talking about right now or that we would be in a zoom meeting doing it right yeah. exactly <laughs> things yeah. things are changing at an unbelievable rate yeah. hey guys before you go too far off the yes. telescope say something about the humidity welcome to north carolina hello <laughs> <laughs> don't want yeah. you i i blew my session three nights ago or two nights ago completely because i looked down and the eyepiece was covered yeah yeah okay. yeah okay well, there are solutions to all of that, too. Oh, yeah. I was just saying speak to it. <laughs> well, tomorrow night, there is a public observing session at uh, Stanton River State Park. I had thought about it, but it seems like since it will not be dark until after 9, yeah. and the session runs from like 9.15 until 11, I'm not sure. And it's going to be 85% or 90% humidity, which means the sky will not really be as black as you would like it to be because all that moisture bounces light yeah. probably not a great night but if you're not busy there would be a chance to go up and s somebody will be there doing something okay yeah uh, well question and I, i'm i'm not sure who just was talking about their eyepiece but you said your eyepiece was covered uh, yeah and that was dana and, i should have been more specific oh, sorry hey dana um <laughs> so i'm i'm a real newbie um so you said your eyepiece was covered you mean it had dew on your eyepiece yeah i uh, well, two things contributed to my problem. I left my eyepiece bag in the house and then I was like, oh, crap. And I pulled it and went. So yeah. it's at a nice, dry 68 degrees. Right. And I went out to, you know, 90 percent humidity. With it. So I was just saying, if you point your telescope up. You can have dew fall on it. You, these guys if know you, way more about it than I do. If you point it yeah. anywhere, Dana, what a, if pretty much, say, yeah. <laughs> it's like a glass of iced tea. What is going to happen? It's going to sweat. Yeah. On the outside. Well, so, yeah. Normally, <laughs> I leave it outside. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, leave it out long enough that it it equilibrates as well. Yeah. What about what about your corrector plate? Did your corrector plate didn't have any dew on it? Oh yeah, I get yeah. I get it all. <laughs> but the yeah. the telescope had been outside. It was yeah. the it was the eyepiece bag. Yeah. 
Okay, I'm, this is going to sound like a real basic question, but if you've got dew on you, the lens of your telescope or on your eyepiece, can you not just clean it off? Uh-oh. Well, <laughs> I'm sorry, I got to ask. Yeah, no, that's, you know, if you no, it off, it's a, that's a great question. Yeah, who, who wants to do that one? You're going to you damage could, the coatings on the eyepiece or well, something. You don't want to scrub around, don't you? You don't really okay. want to do that. You want a hair dryer. You want, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you uh, you you're, you're you're actually starting a religious war now because yeah yeah that's why I wanted somebody else to start it. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you can do what I did, which is I packed up and came home. <laughs> oh no, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'm probably the most the the worst offender, uh, but I, uh, I and no one wants to hear about my solution. So sorry. well, no. What what is pray tell? It's I I have a little propane heater called a power cat and I just uh, I will uh, when I get due on my on my uh, I start that up usually in the night and when I get due on the corrector plate I just kind of hold it over the corrector plate and do a little uh, yeah I I wouldn't do it quite that way (laughs) well see. I well, wondered now, why okay. you had that out there, Doug. I was wondering what exactly. That was That's exactly what it was for. And so it now I was just going to tell you right now, the power cat is a very low heat, but you know it's it, you know it's it's not a flame. I've used this for over twenty years now. No damage to my corrector plate. So all you guys that are wincing, it's, <laughs> for, it works. <laughs> but basically, I just kind of, I just, it has a forced air a fan on it, and I just kind of just so it's it a around. giant hair dryer, yeah. Well, so it's, it's like yeah. a giant hair dryer, yeah, exactly. And then, but there's no electric. I'm not draining any batteries, you know. And then I, and then if I get a, an eyepiece that dues over, I just hold the eyepiece over the over the power cat. Well, so, the solution is to warm it up. One of our guys, I, yeah. I'll I'll leave names out. He just keeps an eyepiece in his pocket. So it warms yeah. up in the pocket. And if yeah. it use over, he swaps. The, he has one in each pocket. He swaps and lets the other one warm up again. You just have to keep it warmer than the ambient temperature. I do that. Okay. Right. And okay. it'll do up if the like, where it's more of a problem is when the temperature is falling mm-hmm. and everything's getting colder and there's a dew point somewhere in that range. When you cross it, everything begins to fog over. Right. And so he puts that back in a pocket. It might get a little lint on it, but you can clean that off. But you don't want to like rub a Kleenex or a cloth or your T-shirt or yeah. something on the lens because over time that abrasion would damage your coatings. Right. Yeah. But uh, I've seen many people use a, a either a twelve volt hair dryer or a you know yeah. regular one twenty hair dryer. That was the old Tommy solution. Now you just buy a dew heater device and wrap a little uh, heating coil around the eyepiece and right. around the finder if you need to and let them keep the temperature warm enough that dew never forms. Just so warm enough. Though. There's a quick, yeah, just barely warm enough. There's equipment to do all of these things. The imaging people have to do this constantly. Okay, okay. So I, think you've also, I think you've also suggested, Jim, is, is taking a hand warmer yeah. uh, and just basically Velcroing mm-hmm. that to the side of your tube or to your eye. Rubber banded on there. And the yeah. heat from the hand warmer will keep up a lot of times. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you can okay. and you can buy a lot of hand warmers before you even get into some of these expensive high tech do do hey, heat solutions. It's, it's only money, Doug. I yeah. don't even. I well, well, the thing is, you know, you don't hear a lot of this now because they can't. They they're not able to make the chips to actually control those things now. Well, so. Yeah, that could be a problem. <laughs> well, to to answer Dana's question or the statement a minute ago, what we used to do when that happened was we all met at the Waffle House and talked about what we might have seen. <laughs> So you need exactly. to know where, where some nice eating place is during the evening so you can retire from there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. It, this should be fun and enjoyable, if yeah. nothing else. Exactly. Yeah. And here's the and that's the thing is I, I I think Jim keeps bringing this point up, but this is the most important point. You really need to have fun with what you're doing. You know, if you get to the point where you, you, you and there's there's so much complexity in your equipment or you're so overstressed of trying to get things together and get out to an observing site, you, you're kind of missing the point uh, of really uh, observing. Of en- of, at least of enjoying the process. Of the enjoyment of it, yeah. But, I definitely but it is fair to say that everybody who's done this for a while 
has a frustrating night due to something. <laughs> yeah. You know, one night, one night you go out and your equipment's not working right and those kinds of things. But I went out to Big Woods one night, not too many years ago, and it was really cold. And I got out of the car and I was going to go talk to whoever was next to me. And I stepped in a water puddle. I remember that night. So that was the end of that one. So I just <laughs> said, hey, you're kidding me. So the shoe is totally wet. It's going to be really cold. And I just went home. Well, what about the night you were near the drug exchange? You remember that? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anything anything can happen. Observe. Yeah, single female goes out to observe, and the latest drug deal goes down across the parking lot from me. That was a little scary. I had somebody shooting a shotgun oh. um, the other night. So, oh, oh my. <laughs> That's a little oh, scary. Dana, it, Dana, where are you observing? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't want to go there. <laughs> it was, they were just, they just pulled into the. Oh, just the, for fun. Yeah. Oh, they just for pulled, fun, eh? Yeah, they pulled into, it's a little field and they're going to build a, a housing complex next to it. And, the, and of course, the conduit and the wires hanging out of the ground, that's going to be the light poles that are going to ruin my mm. observation place. But I've been using it for a while. But some guy came in with a car and he just stopped and he started shooting a shotgun down. Oh, <laughs> I was like, you, you do see me over here, Ray? <laughs> Hello. Yeah, well, yeah. One, one thing, uh, and most of you probably already would just know this instinctively. Most of us don't go out totally alone unless you like if, if you have a friend who owns a farm someplace and they know you're coming, that's not probably an issue. But here in town, some of us go out and use places out near the uh, NC State Stadium and various mm -hmm. places. And I don't usually go unless I have somebody else, one or two other people. So right. part of it's social. We enjoy each other. Mm -hmm. And part of it is so there's enough of us there that it doesn't seem attractive for somebody to come over and bother us. So, right. right. And somebody's looking, the other, watching out. So you can get pretty engrossed in what you're doing and not even realize somebody else is there. So mm -hmm. I would recommend going out at least to start with with some companions. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What's the story about Big Woods? Is that uh, there's a gate there and it's locked, and but uh, is it only a club function that you can go out to that site, or can I just go hop the fence? <laughs> well, you could hop the fence. Yeah, do it. Trespassing. Yeah. <laughs> oh. The yeah, night of the big drug deal, there was no gate. Yeah, in the early days, it was just an open spot, so anyone. Astronomers or drug dealers were free to come there and use that area. Okay. They now have it fenced off, and that's probably good for us. Right. Who owns yeah. that property? Is that the state? The state. Part of the, yeah. well, part of the lake. Actually, the National Forest Service. Oh, that, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah, no, we're only there by grace of their good uh, opinion of us. So if we don't follow sort of sensible policies and let them know we're going to be there, it would be very easy for them to, uh, they've already banned the uh, uh, radio airplane group that met there during the day. Right. And so we're, we're the only people that currently can go. And I say, we, I don't go anymore because it's not for me visually very dark. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't use it, but uh, it's still fun to go with everybody else is out there, but it's not, not really dark anymore. Yeah. The new thing for them is for a couple to not realize that there's people in there and the gate looks closed. So they'll park their car right in front of the gate. And then when yeah. we try and leave, <laughs> surprise, 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 we got to go get, find the couple and get them out of there kind of thing. Oh my. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so I know Vivian, I think you had some questions about observing. I mean, I think we're kind of, we're actually over time. If you wanted to go ahead and ask some of those questions now. Actually, I, I have, during the course of the evening, I, I asked all the questions that I had. Okay. Um, I think my next step is to, to pick out some binoculars and buy them and, and just do some more research on telescopes. I can't um, believe this is working, Vivian. We, for, when I joined the club, everybody said buy binoculars and a star chart and a red flashlight. And all of us went out and bought telescopes. <laughs> and then you eventually buy the binoculars and, you know, do it correctly. But yeah. it, it was hard to get everybody to do it in the beginning. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I figure we're going to want the binoculars for sure. So let's just yeah. start with those. And yeah. Yeah. It, it will amaze you what you can see with them. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and so once, once you do, I, I definitely would suggest that, uh, and I had other slides about the AL observing programs, mm -hmm. which we can, we, you and I, you can always, we can always exchange emails about that later, but there are observing programs that you can actually start executing. Mm -hmm. And so they basically, they basically say, find this object, then find this object, find this, and they want you to, to write something down about what you see and everything. And that really helps you, number one, learn the night sky, but it'll also help you learn to use your binoculars. And it'll yeah. help you help you push your binoculars to the point where you can say, hey, you know, this is this is what I know I can do with these. Mm -hmm. And it gives you structure if, if you it are does. trying to learn the sky and and you'll have a reason to go out and, and the objective leads to something else. I never did it that way. I never took notes. And I regret that now because I've seen a lot of things, but I don't have it. Uh, Phyllis writes a major program used all over the world to record your observing notes. And if if I had started 35 years ago, I don't <laughs> think that program was available then, but it would be great because I could look back over what I had seen and what I thought of it then and what telescope I used and what the seeing was like. All of that just comes out of a program that organizes your observing. Okay. Uh, they used to tell us to, you know, use a journal. Uh, I just do it for the pleasure of doing it and for showing it to each other. And uh, that doesn't make me a methodical observer. So you, you might want to try to sort of find a program that Doug can help you with where you would actually be accomplishing something. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And you get a badge and a, and a certificate. That's right. <laughs> Good for type A people. <laughs> yeah. Oops, um, mm. I, just, I, I just misspelled Staunton River. Uh, so That's okay. uh, I, I understood. <laughs> yeah, Mike. Yeah, Mike was at Mike Mabry was asking a question: Is what's a good campground? Was that an ad? Yeah, Stan. I said so. Stanton, it's Stanton River State Park in Virginia. So, gotcha. <laughs> I misspelled I, it. I did a lookup when you all mentioned that earlier. It seems like their RV slots are kind of uh, limited. Headcount wise, I was thinking for that star party, they're probably already long booked. No, no the, the star party is held out in the middle of a giant field. Jim Froze. The field is probably 300 yards long, too, if you were up there at some other time. Yeah, and you can park your RV right there on the field. Oh, so you, yeah. Now, I will tell you, Mike, what I, what I do when Debbie and I go there. Um, we I'll I'll rent I'll just go ahead and rent uh, an RV uh, slot for that date, and then I'll I'll go I'll go park in the field. Uh, that way, my wife doesn't have to worry about the the red light um, um, requirements or the lighting requirements there. Mm -hmm. So, gotcha. uh, but um, yeah, if, if you can before you do that, if you can kind of you know. Uh, you know, limit the lights that come out of your, your RV and everything, you can park right there on the field and, and no one, uh, and, and it's, it works great. Oh, okay. Can camp in a hotel. <laughs> or camp in a hotel. We, we don't, we don't count that as camping. <laughs> okay. If there's you no can person here person 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 camping. Staying in style. Like that. We've got a couple of members who, uh, I believe Phyllis is not fond of camping as I recall. Mm -hmm. um, I did it for years and years, and I'm done now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, there are, but unfortunately, uh, South Boston is a pretty decent drive. It's about 20, 25 minutes mm -hmm. back. That's the advantage of being there at the park. There aren't any major lights right there. Right. Gotcha. And you have to you watch. can make reservations to the campground. I, I put a link to the uh, reservation area. Right. If anybody wants yeah. to do that, I'll be going there next month. Yeah. You don't have to wait to the star party. Yeah, and yeah. you can go there uh, tomorrow night. As far, if it's clear, there will be a public session tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No, the, uh, it's from, the, the from Crabtree Valley to there. It's about an hour and 40-minute drive. Mm -hmm. how, are, how are the bugs at night, like the no CMs and I would take some bugs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> especially this time of year. Yeah, this time of year it would be kind of, uh, there's some mosquitoes there. And their industrial strength. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but one of the reasons this star party is in October and I guess March, April, it's, it, we're trying to be out of season with mosquitoes. Yeah. Yeah. So in the summer, you have to 
take out. Usually October is not bad at all. Yeah, it's been pretty nice then. Yeah. I mean, you know, a couple other places. I mean, Pettigrew State Park, a lot, uh, some of us used to go there. It, it's a small campground. They only have about 13 campsites, but they are super compliant with respect to they, – they are really – support the astronomy you just tell them that you're going there to do some astronomy and they'll have they'll ask people down the road and everything to turn their lights off and stuff like that so they're really they're really good about that um, that's that's what almost a three-hour drive from here though yeah to Cres creswell yeah it's there. down towards the coast right and then a lot of people go to medoc you know yeah um, several people are there tonight i think oh really so they mentioned it on their list sir they're probably uh, using their white their light buckets to carry w actual water. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the guys, if he goes, I, I'm he not sure he was going tonight, but he has a 30 or 32 inch reflector. So if he's there, it's worth uh, meeting him. Oh yeah. You can see a lot of stuff in a 30 inch reflector. Oh wow. But there, yeah, there's a lot of places you can go to, but none of them are within a half a mile of here. We. You've right. got to drive 30, 40 minutes at least. We go to Howell Woods, another place. That's that is in one. Johnston County, down past Clayton. And there, the gate is always open there at night, so you can come and go. But sometimes there are hunters and fishermen who are there, although it's still perfectly usable. So there, there are places to go, but none of them really close. Mm -hmm. Hey, Jim, you're locking up from time to time. Yeah, well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to do oh, about that. Mar Marvin is asking, if you need to leave a dark, a dark site before uh, before so the other people are finished, uh, if you're driving home, for example, is it possible to leave in a vehicle without blasting others with light? Well, you have to park with that in mind. Uh, Y'all could probably talk more about that, especially at Big Woods. Uh, yeah. But there at the park, we... If you know you're going to leave like at one in the morning, you don't park out on the field. You can't turn on your car lights and drive right out in the middle of a star party. Mm -hmm. So if you're right. going to camp there, some people set up tents and their equipment and a little distance away, and you just put everything in your tent and leave it there. At a star party, most everybody is, has been respectful of equipment and not bothered anybody's stuff. Right. So you don't have to stay there and guard it. That might not be the case on an average weekday at the park when you're up in the campgrounds. I wouldn't leave stuff out in that open field. Yeah, I think uh, Mark talked about that earlier at some point. But uh, but during the star party, everything is pretty safe, I think. Yeah. And you could do what Doug said, park your RV up in the campsites so your family can come and go and turn on lights. And then you may have a tent down on the field by your telescope where you can stretch out and sleep an hour or two and then get up at three in the morning and continue observing. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And also um, at, at Big Woods that uh, people will leave at different times. Um, some people will uh, use their parking lights to try to get a little bit away from the group before they uh, turn on the headlights. But uh, yeah. Um, I, I think it's just good to give other people a heads up that you might be doing that. Um, I haven't run into too many people doing serious long-term imaging out at Big Woods recently. So, um, yeah, I think the imagers have kind of given up on Big Woods now. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I, that's uh, your your point is really well taken, Barton. Is it's uh, just let people know, hey, I'm going to leave, and you know. So, because I, I, with my truck, if I open the door, the lights come on, you mm -hmm. know, which I find a really annoying, but it's part of the, uh, part of the equipment, but, you know, um, it's, um, I, um, you know, uh, it, again, you need to park in a way that you're not going to, you know, blast people out, or if you do, just let people know, hey, I got to get into my car, the lights are going to come on, you know, cover your scope or whatever, cover your eyes, so you, people don't lose that dark ad adaptation. So the lesson here is you should have a really, really old truck. <laughs> yeah. Like I, like I do that. Those smart you know, trucks aren't, aren't worth it. Right. <laughs> they're, too, they're not, they're, they're so smart. They're, they're too dumb. They're dumb. But anyway. You can, you can get red uh, lights, to, uh, replacement lights on your bulbs. I've done that with my car. Yeah. The other thing you can do is just put like a really thick, heavy blanket over your, 
over the front of your car, over the front of your lights, you know? Something locked up. Oh, did I lock up? Yeah. It's maybe we're wearing the Zoom people out. Think, uh, yeah. One of our guys <laughs> that's actually took some vinyl, you know, non trans over his uh, backup lights and brake lights and drive up to the gate to leave Big Woods and then take them off. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, we, over time, you just figure out things. Uh, and like Doug said, sometimes you just yell, I'm going to leave in five minutes. If somebody has a long exposure going, you can mm-hmm. find that out and you can wait an extra minute or two until they're done and then drive away. So, okay. okay. Just communicate and, you know, it, it will work itself out. Okay. Yeah, common thank, courtesy. Thank you all for answering 100 questions. <laughs> well, you have to ask them because, you know, we don't even think about those anymore. We just sort of do it. And uh, these, are the, these are the kind of questions we yeah. used to discuss yeah. after meetings at mm-hmm. the Waffle House. Mm-hmm. Just like where I gained all my knowledge. <laughs> at the Waffle it's, House. Yeah. You just ask. Yeah. It's fun. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, everybody, uh, thanks for coming tonight. And I guess what we can do is, um, you know, I, uh, we'll probably put this out on the on the web at some point. But it is, it will be streaming on Facebook and YouTube on a regular. Uh, I don't you know. know. We better edit some of this. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. <laughs> all right. So, all right. Well, thanks for coming tonight. Thank you.